Hi, this is Bill Monroe. Just a quick note before we start today's conversation with Dr. Kim Middleton, and that's that I am adding this update several months down the road. When Dr. Kim and I recorded our conversation and produced this episode, it turns out it was right before the research came out showing that COVID-19 infections do lead to large vessel occlusion strokes. Many people who survive uh, COVID go on to have a stroke because of COVID. This is not just a disease that you just get and then get over and then you're done. If you survive the disease, you can have long-term disability. You can have a stroke resulting from it. The reason we didn't talk about it during the episode is uh, we hadn't seen that research yet. But now we know and now we're aware of that. Uh, and it's that much more reason to not get this disease. Get the, vac the a vaccine when you are able to, and in the interim, mask up. Remember, masks are not there to protect you. Masks are there to protect the people around you. You don't want a stroke. You don't want to catch COVID. And you don't want to give COVID to somebody else. And this is one of the things that I really want to emphasize is that you might be spreading COVID-19 without even realizing you're infected because it can take up to two weeks before you feel the disease if you have it. That's why you mask up. It's to keep the water droplets from your lungs that may be infected bodily fluids from landing on others and giving them this terrible disease. So protect yourself, protect your family members, protect your loved ones, especially if they're different from your family members, protect your friends, protect your coworkers, protect your communities. Mask up, stay safe, avoid large gatherings, People, we know this. You don't want this disease. You don't want to give this disease to somebody else. And you don't want to have another or your first stroke. So mask up, do what you can, stay safe, and enjoy learning more about the intersection of stroke and COVID-19 in this conversation with Dr. Kim Middleton. You know, even in New York right now, a significant upwards of 40 or 50 percent of some of the hospitalized patients are under the age of 50, um, which is different from what we were hearing in Wuhan, China. And these numbers are changing on a daily basis. Welcome to the Stroke Cast. A Generation X stroke survivor explores rehab, recovery, the frontiers of neuroscience, and how to peel a banana with one hand. Hello, I'm Bill Monroe, and welcome to episode 98 of The Strokecast. This week, I am going to be talking with Dr. Kimberly Middleton, uh, a neurophysiatrist here in Seattle, about COVID-19 novel coronavirus and what we as stroke survivors need to know about it. Now, the information we share in this episode is accurate as of the time of recording, which was March 26th. This is a rapidly evolving situation. New information is coming out all the time. So definitely be sure to always check for the latest information uh, about the disease and the current pandemic that is impacting the world. Now, we talk about a lot of things in this conversation, but I want to address the bottom line up front get, get and answer the question that's, I'm sure, on most people's minds. And that's this. Does having had a stroke put you at higher risk for contracting COVID-19 or for having complications from COVID-19? And the answer is no and yes. Of course, it's going to be a yes and no type of answer. No, in the sense that the neurologic event of having had a stroke does not put you at higher risk. However, the conditions that may have led to that stroke also put you at higher risk for COVID-19. So in the, uh, in the, this is something the doctors refer to as comorbidity. So, if your stroke was related to, for example, hypertension, cholesterol, um, 
smoking or other lung conditions or or things like that, then yes, those very same conditions could put you at higher risk for contracting COVID-19. Um, and of course, if you are smoking or vaping still, knock it off. You know better than that at this point. Uh, but those conditions do put do put us at higher risk for contracting the disease. At the same time, specific stroke deficits or disabilities can also impact our ability to uh, resist the disease or to fight off the complications. For example, a weak cough, uh, which could result from a hemiparesis or weak core muscles, um, could make it harder to fight off the disease or its complications. Uh, swallowing challenges can also uh, cause problems for the lungs. And so there are all these other things that go along with that as well. So no, having had a stroke does not inherently put you at higher risk. However, the things that may have led to your stroke can put you at higher risk. So be aware of that. Uh, do what you need to do to stay as healthy as you can. Keep taking all of those uh, recommended medications from your medical team uh, and best of luck. So as I said, today I'm joined by neurophysiatrist Dr. Kimberly Middleton. You may have heard me talk about her before. She was one of the awesome rehab doctors when I was in the hospital and she still coordinates my recovery and gives me my Botox and Dysport injections to treat my tone and spasticity. And of course, if you're in the Seattle area and looking for a physiatrist, I strongly recommend you go see Dr. Kim. Uh, that said, while Dr. Kim is a doctor, unless she is actively treating you, she is not your doctor. Before you make any changes to your care plan or to the execution of your treatment plan, please be sure to speak with your personal doctor or medical team. Dr. Kim, thank you so much for joining us on uh, StrokeCast uh, in this episode. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's it's always, always fun to chat with you and even more so when you're not sticking neurotoxins into me. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I guess to start off here, way too many people out there and way too many survivors have not worked with a physiatrist or even know what that specialty is. And, and that's really unfortunate. To start off, what is a physiatrist? You know, when I was in medical school, that was an issue too. Among my medical school colleagues, nobody really knew what a physiatrist was, and it wasn't a very common rotation to do in uh, medical school. And so I got that question from my medical school colleagues as well. Um, I had been introduced to the field because one of my dad's um, best friends is a physiatrist in Ohio, and I really loved the field as I learned more about it in medical school. So part, I think, of the confusion and lack of awareness of our field is that it has a lot of different names. We are also in different parts of the country um, called physical medicine and rehabilitation doctors, and yet in other places we're termed rehabilitation medicine doctors. And so part of it might be that the label kind of, kind of changes depending upon where you are. And, and half the time if I type it out, people just assume I misspelled psychiatrist. Oh, yes, exactly. We get that all the time. Or if we say we're rehab doctors, they assume drug and alcohol rehabilitation as opposed to musculoskeletal or neurologic rehab. But the way I kind of like to describe our specialty is a focus on recovery of function. So I have musculoskeletal colleagues that do sports medicine and help people recovering from sports injuries. I have musculoskeletal colleagues that focus on spine care, non-operative management of back pain, and do injections and do help work with their therapist to get people back to the community and to activity. And in that case, the folks who are doing the non-surgical uh, uh, spine care and all of that, we're not talking about chiropractors here. Correct. Although sometimes we work in conjunction with chiropractors and even acupuncturists to achieve 
the return of function for patients, depending on the case. We do have some osteopathic doctors in our department that do some uh, manual adjustments of patients as part of their care, but we oftentimes have them working very closely with physical therapists to develop a treatment plan. My specific field is in neurologic rehabilitation, and so um, I work both in a hospital format and in an outpatient clinic working on neurologic recovery from stroke care, uh, spinal cord injury, brain injury, brain tumor recovery, um, any number of neurologic conditions, multiple sclerosis, um, Guillain-Barre, So I see patients in the hospital setting when they have their acute diagnosis and help with their recovery, and I work with them in the outpatient side, um, whether it's in terms of helping with bracing, working with a therapist, doing injections of botulinum toxin to address spasticity, that sort of thing. Right. So, uh, so what you're doing then is you're working with, uh, like, like I said, a lot of these neuro patients on a day to day basis, uh, of which all stroke patients pretty much are and, and sort of helping us get, get back our, our physical, uh, abilities then. Exactly. And, and that's, that's one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you for, for this episode, because a lot of what we are hearing about in the media, we're hearing all about, uh, COVID-19, coronavirus, and, you know, its general impacts. But, uh, we don't hear a lot about stroke specific impacts and potential impacts of the, uh, of the virus, which is, uh, a little disappointing considering, you know, 25% of adults over the age of 25 will have a stroke in mm-hmm. their lifetime. But let's, let's, let's start with this then. What, uh, you know, obviously it's very scary and we're, we're shutting down everything, but what exactly does this virus do to you? Great question. Um, so backing up a little bit. So coronaviruses as a class of viruses have been around for a long time. And we have all, you know, all of us in the community have been exposed to coronaviruses in general from one time to another. And they often take the form of mild upper respiratory tract infections. COVID-19 is a new human virus. And COVID, just for anybody who's not familiar with that terminology, um, is a um, standard abbreviation. CO stands for corona. V stands for virus. D is for disease. And it was discovered at the end of 2019, hence the name COVID-19. As far as what exactly it does, it works like many other viruses that we have had in the past, um, spread through droplets when people cough or sneeze. Um, They're spread through human contact or through common surfaces that people touch that then aren't sanitized. And as far as what symptoms they cause in us, that's a challenge because there's quite a range or spectrum. Some people are completely asymptomatic. Some people will have mild symptoms. Think the th- types of symptoms that you would think of with the common flu, low-grade fever, body aches, coughing, some nasal congestion, a runny nose, maybe a sore throat, and it's, you know, a week or so of uncomfortable, maybe two weeks of uncomfortable symptoms, and then they feel better. So, so when, when you say a low-grade fever, it, what, what sort of the number we would attach to define a fever as low-grade? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think in the hospital, we've been using a temperature of 100.4 as kind of a threshold, um, 100 or 100.4. But that said, we're seeing people test positive that are having temperatures in the 99 range as well. So it's kind of very patient specific, especially if they have some of the other symptoms. Um, I think that the, the scary part about this virus is while for some people they might be asymptomatic or mild, it can have a very, very severe presentation too that requires hospitalization. Um, some of the numbers we've seen so far, about 20% of the population needs to be hospitalized. And in specific um, patient populations, it can really cause severe symptoms and even death as, as we're hearing in the news cycles. So when when it when it's causing death uh, and severe symptoms, what what systems in the body is it particularly attacking? Good question. 
Uh, so you, it starts, you know, in the in the in the upper airways, and then proceeds to the lungs and causes an inflammatory reaction. It can um, pre- predispose us to a complicating bacterial pneumonia, in in addition to the viral infection, um, which then can become very severe and compromise oxygen. Uh, uptake um, to the muscles and to vital organs. Uh, Patients that are hospitalized with severe symptoms can develop systemic infections called sepsis, and they can develop um, what we call like a cytokine storm or a severe inflammatory reaction that can damage multiple uh, organs, including the kidneys, um, can damage the heart and cause an inflammatory reaction in the heart. And then in those cases, patients can be really in a fragile state. Right. So, so that those uh, inflammatory responses, those really severe responses, that is, uh, would we consider that sort of an autoimmune type of thing where the body's own immune system is, is sort of panicking and reacting super strong that ends up damaging itself? Exactly. I think that's a good way of describing it. Um, some of the most damaging parts of this virus appear to be from this sort of secondary immune reaction that our bodies do that's um, excessive and therefore um, ends up doing more damage than good to fight the infection. You know, we, you know, what I've heard mostly on the news is about the lung issues, but obviously it goes way beyond that. It's, it's really not just about that, but you know, of course, the lungs become sort of the central focus with everything they talk about with the shortage of ventilators. Mm-hmm. But the other key thing we, we hear a lot is about how uh, high risk individuals need to be, you know, really especially cautious and isolate, do more of the cleaning. And they talk, you know, we, we hear the term immunocompromised, uh, you know, as one of the big indicators for that. But a- as folks who have survived a stroke, does that in particular put us in the higher risk category? Good question. Again, um, you know, I, I I have definitely heard on some news articles and some news cycles that stroke survivors are among the list of patients or individuals that uh, are at higher risk. Um, although I haven't seen any actual studies yet that, uh, you know, specifically look at stroke recover uh, patients that have survived a stroke as um, why they would be more at risk. However, I think the common ground is that out of, out of the studies that come out, have come out of Wuhan, China so far, there are certain patient populations that are more at risk. Those um, over a certain age, certainly um, 70 70 and above, 80 and above, um, those that have other comorbidities or other underlying health conditions like high blood pressure, like diabetes, like underlying lung disease that someone might have through smoking. And so these actually are some of the same medical comorbidities or Uh, conditions that cause people to have strokes. So I think that's where the common ground is, right? If you have survived a stroke, you may have had high blood pressure, diabetes, and maybe a smoking history that increased your risk of having the stroke. And those are the same qualities that are causing more likelihood of getting infected and of having more severe cases with this coronavirus. So it's not so much that uh, stroke puts you at a higher unique risk for uh, a COVID-19 infection as much as the same things that put you at risk for stroke also put you at higher risk for more severe COVID-19 complications. That's my thinking. I mean, I think the okay. challenge in answering some of these questions is the data is very preliminary. You know, we're only getting reports as they become available, as people are able to gain access to the information of the last few months and try and make sense of it. And so I think as more time passes, we're going to have an even better understanding of, you know, what this virus does to different uh, individual populations of people. But that's my, that's what I'm theorizing right now is the link between stroke survivors being at high risk. And it's really the underlying conditions um, that are placing them at a higher risk from what we know so far. And, and that makes a lot of sense. I mean, we talk about uh, the science of stroke and recovery and risk. Most of the stuff that we talk about where we talk about the science says this, there's like 
three, four, five, ten, twenty years of science right. backing up those conclusions. Everything we know now really is over three months when nobody is allowed to travel anywhere to share information <laughs> anyway. Absolutely. My, my hope is that through all of this, since this is a global pandemic, that it will ultimately work to bring together all of these hospital systems, all of these scientists, all of these researchers to share and combine information towards understanding this virus and towards understanding the development of antivirals and ultimately a vaccine to help manage it at a global level. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think, it, you know, if anything positive is going to come out of all this, uh, you know, the, the, I, I see it as having a huge change and, and impact in the feasibility of work from home, remote work mm-hmm. and software and services that do provide uh, access for those those conversations. Absolutely. Um, you know, as far as stroke recover, um, stroke survivor populations, though, even though I, I haven't seen as of yet any data on COVID-19 and its um, relationship to that population, I, I think we could theorize based on any severe upper respiratory infection that there are some sequela of stroke that might put someone at a slightly higher risk of a more... Se- sequela? Well... Thank you for um, so. In terms of um, impairments that patients might have after a stroke, that might put them at a slightly higher risk of either getting infected or having their bodies have being a little bit more challenged in fighting off the infection. Gotcha, gotcha. So, so, so let let's talk about that then a little bit more. Um, for those of us with hemiparesis or paralysis. Uh, that may impact half or more of our, our bodies. How, how does, how does that impact the body's ability to deal with an, 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 inf- an infection and specifically a lung infection? So I'm kind of thinking based on my own experience in working with patients. Um, but I, I would suspect that if you have weakness on one side of your body, much like if you had a spinal cord injury and weakness at a certain level of your body, if that weakness affects your muscles of respiration, um, the muscles that are involved in giving you a strong cough reflex to clear secretions from your upper airways and to clear infections in your lungs, I would suspect that you'd be at a higher risk of developing um, a pneumonia if you can't clear those upper airway infections and also of of managing the severe symptoms if you develop a complicating pneumonia. So, um, to me, my, you know, again, marketing guy speculation here, that that then uh, seems to indicate when we talk about that, like, say, weaker core muscles might Mm -hmm. then impact the ability of the diaphragm to clear the lungs. Is is that an accurate assessment? I think it could be. Again, I, I haven't seen any formal studies to be able to demonstrate that definitively, but that logic would make sense to me. And what about uh, folks who are then um, living with uh, swallowing challenges? Is, is that sort of in that, that same vein then, or is that <laughs> no pun intended? Uh, <laughs> I, I think so. I think there, if you have difficulties with swallowing to begin with, um, we know that patients are at more risk for, or individuals are at more risk for having some food or some liquid go down the wrong pipe, so to speak, and into the lungs, putting them at risk for an aspiration pneumonia. Um, so I would think along the same lines that um, if you're having a weakened cough and ability to clear secretions from a swallowing problem, that that might also make you a little bit more at risk for getting the infection in the first place. And, and, and that makes a lot of sense. So, uh, let's, let's move up the body a little bit to some of the, the other common, uh, challenges and deficits folks face. Do you think there's anything, uh, about folks who experience, who live with aphasia where, uh, they might face some specific challenges with regards to, uh, COVID-19 uh, or other language processing challenges? 
Um, well, certainly, I mean, when we think of aphasias, um, they come in multiple categories. Um, in terms of a receptive aphasia, where an individual has difficulty understanding the information that they're taking in from around them, whether it's news or a caregiver, a family member, um, if they don't understand because they can't understand the language of what's going on fully with this coronavirus outbreak and in terms of the precautionary steps that we need to be taking in terms of hand hygiene and sanitizing surfaces and not touching eyes, nose, and mouth, um, they might have more difficulty in being consistent and avoiding those things. I mean, theoretically, if you had a very severe expressive aphasia, meaning difficulty communicating out to your family or friends, maybe you wouldn't be able to let them know as easily if you're having some initial symptoms. But a lot of these symptoms are more objective. Like if you have a, have a low-grade temperature or any sort of a fever, if you start to develop a cough, um, if you have uh, oxygen levels dropping a little bit, I mean, those things would be visibly uh, um, obvious to anybody around them, hopefully. So I'm not sure that would cause too much of an issue. Okay. And I imagine it would be um, similar for folks who are facing other cognitive challenges, whether that be memory or executive function. Uh, ultimately, it's going to depend on how attentive their caregivers are mm -hmm. to their health. Exactly. And, and I think, speaking of caregivers, I think it um, is important that caregivers are very aware, as they oftentimes are going to be helping get groceries for their loved ones, go shopping for their loved ones to help the, their loved ones stay at home and minimize their risk, that they need to be very cognizant of their own um, social distancing so that they don't inadvertently, despite great intentions, end up ex exposing their loved ones at home. Yeah, ab absolutely. And that, that gets back to the, the whole thing of way back in the day when we used to be allowed to travel on airplanes. <laughs> one of the uh, first things they, they would tell you as the plane's getting ready to take off is they give you the safety briefing and it's always put your own mask on before mm -hmm. helping others. Caregivers need to be especially vigilant while they're taking care of a survivor about their own health and their own condition because if a caregiver becomes hospitalized, that causes even additional problems. So definitely take care of yourself and maybe now is also a good time to think about what happens if you're not able to take care of the person that you're caring for. Is there an alternative care plan in place should something happen to you? Should you uh, even just test positive and have to isolate from anybody else? I think that's a really good point for families to come together and come up with these theoretic scenarios that hopefully will never come to pass, but just so that they can be prepared and know what other alternatives there might be and other ways of providing care, um, of enabling individuals to get the supplies and the resources they need at home. There are a lot of communities that are banding together um, to pool resources and, and have, you know, neighbor neighbors that are offering to go out into the community and go grocery shopping for other people that are higher risk. Um, so, I mean, there are some opportunities for some real kindness here. Um, there, there are certainly um, care agencies that can be hired to replace a caregiver temporarily. Um, those oftentimes are out-of-pocket expenses and can be prohibitive for a lot of families, but it is an option or a resource. And certainly, um, calling your primary care doctor's office and um, using the resources of a social worker might help plug people in with resources in their community. Yeah, absolutely. And even outside of COVID-19, those are just sort of generally good practices and contingency plans to have in place because, um, you know, obviously COVID-19 is not the only health challenge and, and risk people face out in the community. We still have all of our regular day-to-day -day stuff going on. Absolutely. And and certainly, I guess this would be a good point for me to just reiterate be, people being as compliant as possible at taking their medications reliably because we want people to avoid needing to go into a clinic or a hospital for any circumstance, avoid, uh, you know, protecting themselves from any repeat heart event or repeat stroke event by taking their blood pressure medications, their cholesterol medications, their antiplatelets reliably right now um, because we want to avoid 
avoid people needing to go into the hospital for any circumstance. Yeah, absolutely. And and th- and that's a that's an excellent point to bring up too because you know, and even a lot of the uh reports I see and a lot of the just the the general feedback I see is that uh many folks are just like, well, I'm young, I'm healthy, my mm-hmm. immune system is fine. I don't have to worry about this. The thing is with our hospitals being stretched as thin as they are, a lot of the COVID-19 related deaths that will happen as a result of this pandemic and you know i don't i'm not fear-mongering deaths are actually happening but a lot of them won't be from the virus itself there will be ones from people who have to who are in car accidents and can't get a bed in the hospital or suffer another disease or another accident or uh, drug overdoses or they miss their critical medications and, you know, the ERs are overwhelmed, the the medical staffs are overwhelmed. And I don't know how you and your colleagues are getting any sleep these days. But, uh, you know, as we put extra strain on the system, do everything you can to not strain the system. Precisely. I mean, I think it's really important that the accurate information is getting out to people um, through social media, through podcasts, because it's true. There was initially the sentiment that young people are unaffected and shouldn't worry, but boy, that is not the case at all because it might translate into increasing exposure for more vulnerable populations. And, you know, even in New York right now, a significant upwards of 40 or 50 percent of some of the hospitalized patients are under the age of 50, um, which is different from what we were hearing in Wuhan, China. And these numbers are changing on a daily basis. So you always have to take them with a grain of salt. Um, But still, I mean, that's speaking to the point that at all ages, we need to be taking the necessary precautions for ourselves and our loved ones. Yeah, very much so. So, so as, as we're, uh, we're talking about some of these threats and some of these more specific things, um, you know, when we start talking about heart inflammation or other challenges, does, does this virus or these conditions pose an enhanced threat to folks who may have a, uh, an untreated PFO, uh, opening in the middle of the heart between the two sides or unwrap, unruptured aneurysms in their, in their brains? That's a good question, and I don't have any specific literature to cite at this point on those specific conditions. You are absolutely right in in stating that um, some of the patients that are hospitalized with COVID-19 can have increased heart strain as their bodies are fighting these infections. They can have arrhythmias develop. They can have inflammation of the heart muscle itself called myocarditis develop. Um, so how that translates to, um, you know, risks with a, a patent foramen ovale or a PFO um, or an unruptured aneurysm, I, you know, I don't know specifically. I mean, if, if someone's blood pressure goes high, sky high in mounting an infection, um, you know, a response to an infection, I suppose that aneurysm would be more at risk. But I don't think there's any data um, out on that as of yet. Um, and I don't know of any data yet to suggest that um, people are more likely to develop clots because of the COVID-19 infection, so long as the appropriate precautions are being made in the hospital to protect them from um, blood clots, um, as we do for all hospitalized patients. Oh, that's, that's, that's great news. Um, so it also sounds like, uh, with the recommendation to make sure you're staying on any antiplatelet or anticoagulant or blood thinner medication, that we're not seeing any increased risk, or we haven't observed any increased risk from taking those medications in terms of infection at this point. That's correct. And I know there were some articles and some re- um, some recent discussions, um, discussions between providers that um, certain classes of blood pressure medications might um, pose significant risks if you have um, COVID-19, specifically the class of ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers. But that really has not proven to have sufficient medical evidence to make us think that that's actually true at this point. There's lots of literature going on, um, but there was recently some joint um, physician statements that came out from the American Heart Association, the Heart Failure Society of America, and the American um, College of Cardiology urging patients 
uh, not to stop the, those, those medications, that there is not medical evidence to suggest that they put people at more risk and they are important to continue to take for their heart health and for their um, stroke prevention purposes. Oh, that's 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 great news. And I think that also highlights a couple of things. It highlights uh, that there is a lot of research ongoing and that we are learning more every day and things we may have thought we knew two months ago yeah. uh, may not be true anymore. So I always double check with the latest uh, medical uh, medical information with your uh, your medical team or with the latest research sites, uh, whether that's going to be the American Heart Association, uh, the World Health Organization, the, these other places that are going to have up to date information. I think that's a really important message for people to hear because there's lots of information out there and the, it's kind of a moving target right now as we try and understand this better. And six months from now, I think we'll have a much more solid understanding than we do right now. Absolutely. So in, in the interim, um, you know, we'd like to sort of uh, understand what we should be doing. I mean, with the travel restrictions in places and the places that haven't restricted travel are still encouraging us to uh, stay home. What should uh, survivors be doing who uh, are already participating in outpatient physical therapy, occupational therapy or speech therapy? Should we uh, be discontinuing those therapies in the meantime or, 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 or what are you, gem what are, what are you generally seeing the recommendations be? Yeah, I, I think that generally the recommendations are right now we should be minimizing or avoiding all non-essential clinic visits that might increase folks' risk of getting an infection. It pains me to, to say that, especially with regards to therapy, because those PT, OT, and speech therapy sessions are so vital for patients' recovery. Um, but across hospital systems, they're developing their own protocols. And at least within mine at Swedish, we've unfortunately been closing the outpatient therapy clinics. Um, we're working on trying to develop some telehealth or virtual visits um, that might be an option for patients. I know one of my patients um, is um, doing telehealth through another hospital system. So there are means of staying in communication with the therapist. Um, I think this is where you need to really dive into your home exercise program that these therapists have been giving you at these outpatient therapy sessions and continue to stay active within your home environment so you don't lose progress along the way. Um, the other thing that I like to try and encourage patients is there are a wealth of different resources online and on um, YouTube as far as means of staying active but in a safe way from home. Um, specifically on the stroke org, um, organization website. They have some sitting exercises and some post-stroke exercise videos that patients can consult um, just to supplement the home exercise program they already have. Awesome. And we will include those links over in the, uh, over in the show notes as well. Uh, and I think there's uh, the other thing I want to want to emphasize there too, is that, um, yeah, we, we really don't want to have to discontinue that, that therapy, but, you know, obviously it's much better to discontinue that than to risk catching COVID-19 and straining the systems and exposing yourself and others and all of that. At the same time, there is still some of that perception out there that your recovery is limited to six months or 12 months or 24 months, uh, post stroke. And, of course, I do want to emphasize that that is nonsense. If you have been out of mm -hmm. therapy for five years, you can still go back to therapy and make progress. So, you know, taking a break is not a good thing, but it's certainly absolutely not the end of the world for your recovery. Absolutely. And it just means that you might be doing those exercises in a modified fashion with um, different equipment. And we certainly don't want people trying to push themselves too hard at home and injuring themselves, but done in a way maybe collaboratively with some family members or caregivers. Um, there are still ways that you can kind of maintain a stretching program, um, some sitting stre um, strengthening exercises, and um, still keep yourself moving so that you don't feel like you're losing ground and you're still making forward progress. 
Oh, great. So, I mean, what uh, can we do today? Uh, you know, we want to obviously keep moving, keep doing our exercises. Is there anything we can do today uh, to increase our chances of successfully fighting off this disease if we catch it? So certainly, I think we've already talked about how we need to be maximizing our preventative actions, um, socially distancing, as difficult as that is, um, avoiding touching our eyes, nose, and mouth, which is something we're so accustomed to doing on a daily basis, but really um, washing our hands with soap and water or with sanitizer if soap and water isn't available very consistently and certainly before any meals, um, being proactive and disinfecting your home um, surfaces as frequently as possible, even with home deliveries as they're coming in. If you're avoiding the grocery stores that way, that's a wonderful strategy, but just maybe wipe down all of those um, all of those items as they come into contact um, in your home. Um, I think certainly keeping your immune system working as strongly as possible is one of the things you need to be proactive for with. That means Obviously, eating a very nutritious diet, that means trying to get exercise as you can within your home environment um, or doing some walking while socially distancing in the neighborhoods um, and also prioritizing adequate sleep and making sure that you really are keeping your body as strong as possible during this time. In, in other words, all of this stuff that we're supposed to be doing anyway. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it, exactly. It's funny how it, yeah. Yeah. Those, those basics really do make a difference. There's a reason they're basic and fundamental and talked about so often. Yep. Yeah, I think going back to the basics is important and certainly, you know, maintaining good um, vitamin intake and vitamin C and new, um, and supplements is probably worthwhile um, at this point too. Excellent. Excellent. And what we'll, uh, what I'll also try to do is go ahead and find some videos to share of one hand washing techniques for washing your ah, one hand. Yes. Because that can be uh that can that can be a challenge. I've I've always been a big fan of I know a lot of uh a lot of public restrooms have been eliminating um air blow dryers in favor of paper towels, but that seems kind of ableist to me because it's very mm -hmm. difficult to use those with one hand, but that is a rant for another day. No, but that's a really, really good point um, that we should be cognizant of and, and making sure that people can really protect themselves properly. Yeah, very much so. Um, so uh, if folks wanted to know, uh, know more about uh, COVID-19 or, um, or if folks wanted to know more about you and your background, where should they go? Great question. So for COVID-19, you've named some of the uh, sites already that I would recommend. Certainly, the World Health Organization is an excellent resource. The CDC is an excellent resource. Uh, the Swedish website, if you go online for Swedish.org, um, they have some uh, information for uh, individuals on um, COVID-19, um, basic answers to commonly asked questions, and also some direct links to the CDC um, that can be a, uh, a supplemental resource. I certainly encourage patients to check out um, the American Heart Association um, and the um, um, the Stroke Association. Um, specifically, there is actually a posted video right now um, on the Stroke Organization website um, that it features Dr. Eduardo Sanchez, who is the CMO of the American Heart Association, and he does a lovely job answering some of these similar questions for patients after stroke um, and as it relates to COVID-19. So that might be a nice video resource for patients to check out as well. Fantastic. Uh, is there anything else you would like uh, survivors or caregivers to know? Just take good care of yourselves, and we will all get through this together, and um, just stay well. All right. Thank you very much. This has been fantastic. I'm thrilled you could join us here, and uh, uh, maybe we'll be able to have you on uh, for a future episode when we could talk about more, uh, for lack of a better term, normal <laughs> <laughs> rehab-type stuff. Oh, it's been my pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. I look forward to it. 
And that brings us to our hack of the week. I would say that especially timely right now is it would be good for people to see if they can find ways to convert their home into its own gym since they aren't going to be able to get out to um, their therapy clinics as regularly as they'd like. There are some websites that I would like to encourage people to check out um, that can give some helpful recommendations for um, home exercises. Um, certainly through the NA, um, the National Health Services um, UK website, there are some sitting exercises. Silver Sneakers has some options. DisabilityHorizons.com has some options. And the other thing that I know my family has been utilizing that I think is good for all of us to remember is there are some options for visual social networking so that we don't feel quite so um, socially distanced during this time. Um, there is an app called Marco Polo that people can download to their phones and it allows sort of back and forth video chats so that you can keep in touch with people. And it's not just a text message, but actually a, a video um, clip. So it feels a little bit more real. And Zoom is another social networking um, application that I know my kids have been using to stay in touch with their playmates <laughs> and at school. And that's good for all of us. I think um, this can be a very difficult time as people are feeling confined to their homes in a lot of ways and unable to see loved ones and get visits as frequently as, as they'd like. And so that's another way to kind of boost the spirits and know that we're all in this together. I found this conversation with Dr. Kim to, well, it'd be reassuring. I mean, the things that I can do to protect myself and my loved ones are, you know, the simple and obvious ones. And they're really the ones that I should be doing anyway. You're going to continue to hear a lot about COVID-19 novel coronavirus in the coming months. Be very careful with what you hear and with where you hear it. Be sure to check the sources of anything that you hear about this disease. Avoid the rumors that and, and focus instead on credible science-based medical facts. And when questions come up, check with your doctor and, you know, stay safe. To share this episode with a friend, family member, or social media channel, use the link strokecast.com slash COVID-19. Be sure also to head over to strokecast.com slash COVID-19 for all of the links Dr. Kim talked about and to learn more. Stay safe. And of course, as always, don't get best, get better. Thanks a lot. I'm Bill Monroe, and I'll talk to you soon. The Stroke Cast, Bill Monroe, and Bill's guests provide general information and entertainment, not medical advice. Please do not make any changes to your treatment plan or the execution of your treatment plan without first consulting your personal doctor or medical team. The Stroke Cast is a proud production of the Currently Speaking Podcast Network. Thank you.